welcome to Open Facts uh, Science webinars. Uh, this is our April uh, month. We are going to be covering the topic of workflow tools for life science and research. And so we have a number of, of panelists uh, and speakers that I'll introduce in a minute. What I, I want to just say that we're recording this uh, webinar so that we can upload it to SlideShare and uh, etc. So hopefully that's okay with everyone and we'll make the slides available as, as I've said. So welcome to all of you joining uh, in our April or, or sort of Q2 uh, science webinar. Uh, we were delighted to have a, a range of speakers today uh, representing different aspects of our industry. Uh, and I'll just quickly run through the agenda that we'd like to, to cover today. And then I'll briefly uh, introduce our, our speakers and panelists as well, and uh, we'll then get make a start. So uh, in terms of our, our sort of presentations, first of all, we have Michael Crusoe uh, kicking off with an, an introduction to the common workflow language, which he'll be able to provide uh, a bit more information about that, uh, uh, that, that project, which is attempting to integrate across uh, the, 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 vi the wide variety of workflow languages. And then we have a couple of talks about the use of, of workflow, bo both from examples from Open Facts and, and more broadly. One from, from James Lumley, who, who is at uh, Eli Lilly, and then secondly uh, from Jean-Marc Neves, who's based at Janssen, uh, and they'll be covering the NIME and Pipeline Pilot worlds. And then we're also delighted to have a broad panel this afternoon covering uh, both our panelists as I've mentioned and then in addition to them we have Derek Marin from Eli Lilly, we have Daniela Diggles from University of Vienna and also Andre Caracotti from Biovia. So welcome to those and thank you for your time in presenting today. To, to get us started uh, I'd like to hand over to uh, Michael and I'll just switch uh, display screens so we can show up his slides and uh, as I say I'll hand over to Michael to let him um, kick off with introducing the common workflow language. Over to you Michael. Hey thanks Nick for the introduction. Uh, if we could start at the very first slide. Nick is being my hands today. So I'm Michael Crusoe, I'm one of the co-founders and the community engineer for the common workflow language. And I'm here to sort of introduce the project, give a, a broad overview, and then happy to answer questions that uh, Nick's going to collect uh, during the panel session. So uh, going on to the, the second slide, uh, I'll point out, by the way, my slides are online. And I'm sure that that link will be emailed out later, but you can put a short link in the upper right hand corner. Probably the open facts crowd understands the value of a workflow management system. Um, obviously, open facts integrates with a lot of workflow systems. And I, I ha usually have this slide to motivate why do we care about these things at all. And I like to talk about what makes a good workflow management system. And just to, just to quickly define some terms, when I say workflow, I mean doing any sort of computational data analysis. So I'm not talking about process management or other uses of the terms. And so uh, a few things, you know, we love scaling, we love having a graphical user interface, and also a good workflow system should help us track provenance. So just setting the stage for about some of these terms. Um, but really the key thing is the very first one there, the separation of concerns. A good workflow management system lets us focus on our, our tools, how they, how they connect with each other, the research and the science that we're doing, and have separately that conversation about and, uh, doing optimization, scaling it up, um, so, so that different communities, different expertise can be involved in those two different conversations, but also keep it separate where we can. On to the next slide, um, uh, I, it's a series of slides I use to motivate why, why have a standard, why should we care about these things. Is, you know, once you've been convinced because you've used a workflow management system, or some other experience that you, you know, this should happen, that your, your research, your data analysis should be using one. You might go shopping for one. I uh, collect uh, sci workflow management systems used in scientific research on the CWL uh, GitHub Wiki. 
And the next couple of slides that Nick can page through here are just a screenshot of a while ago. I think I'm, I'm over 116 at the moment. I think there's one more screen. Yes, yeah, so this is out of date. And I just added some um, this last week. So there are a lot of different great systems out there. They're used by a lot of different groups. And I think we can't stop making these. So we need a, a way to be able to move from them because previous to CWL, there was no way to move from, you know, from nine to Galaxy or, you know, to do any of these other approaches to move from, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, things like Arvados and Seven Bridges or even um, Taverna to nine, right? So any of those sort of movement you want to have or collaborating between institutes that use different infrastructure was really kind of not happening because of this lack of, of, of common language. Though recently there have been some works to do with uh, conversion. So on the next slide um, is, uh, we can just zip through that to get all the bullet points up there, is about the benefits of having standards. Because we can't say to our colleagues, well, you just should all use the same system. That's the typical approach, right? Oh, well, all the other systems don't work. You should use this new one. That's not going to happen. So because researchers and scientists do move between these systems, we need a way to, to talk amongst them. And actually, I think a good standard helps promote innovation. And um, we're already seeing this today. It's building an ecosystem of tooling, of visualizers, um, of users collaborating across institutions and continents. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, just so, uh, you know, over a couple years, uh, it's, we're coming up on our, th our third anniversary, this, this project has released standards to describe command line tools and the workflows made from them. It's not a new platform. It's a standard that can be implemented by existing platforms or new ones because there will always be more. And, you know, we provided a schema, a specification, a conformance test suite, um, and we've designed it for a variety of ways that people do computing these days. So traditional academic clusters, in the cloud, or even single machine. The model we use isn't dependent on any one of those things. Um, so we're already seeing people being able to use CWL to collaborate from a cloud Docker container approach to folks doing single machine or classic uh, academic grid systems. If we go on to the next slide, um, what's great, and you know, I really take a lot of pride in CWL, is we began at the Bioinformatics Open Source Conference at a hackathon uh, two and a half, almost three years ago. And along the way, a lot of other people have um, found value in, in this project and have assisted and provided uh, their expertise and their experience and have used this to do their science and their research. Um, and so everybody loves a good logo splash. And the most important part here, those on the bottom, it says your logo here. We're really open to new implementers and new users. We, there, a standard is nothing without users and implementers. So, so I, come, come talk to me, come talk to the community if you'd like to be involved. But moving forward, um, so, one of the, the pitches I make for CWL is sometimes we have different um, ways that we like to work with workflows. Some of us like to use graphical user interfaces. Some of us uh, enjoy te our text editors and the command line. And so we're already seeing CWL being used to bridge these different modalities. So I develop on my laptop all the time on remote systems. And I can go visualize the, the work I've done with somebody who's used to more you know, rich graphical interface. Um, and there's lots of backends available. So if you can imagine a place people run their research at scale, uh, CWL is running there today. On the next slide, we will talk about some of the design principles in designing the standard. Uh, we really want it to be easy for systems to implement, but because sometimes users and, and researchers will actually see the underlying syntax. Um, we, we do try to balance their needs as well. So we chose YAML the, uh, to build upon instead of XML or JSON for maximum readability. We 
again, we don't want a standard to get in the way of innovation. So we support uh, a strong extensibility. And that's actually not how new features get developed. Much like the modern way the, the internet web browser standards are developed, where a particular vendor or research community tries something out, they get it working, they convince other people to implement it, and then it makes it into the main core of the standard. And that's the model we've adopted. And we think linked, uh, linked data is really key. And we support uh, plugging in any linked data vocabulary for use in metadata and, and other purposes. And since this was an uh, engineer-driven uh, project, uh, or originated project, we really care about pragmatism. So we, we try to not make en perfect the enemy of the good and the useful. Let's look at the next slide. So if we go back, this is just an example of how we use linked data. And you know, in linked data land, hy hyperlinks or you know, URL is, is how you sort of pass on a, a reference. So for example, because the common workflow language, even though it came from the bioinformatics community, it's not specific to that. So we didn't embed anything about FastQ or you know, different file formats or subfile formats or anything into CWL. But we allow other communities to plug in their vocabularies into us. So as a specific example, the Edom ontology um, from Elixir can be plugged straight into CWL to be used to describe your file formats or the types of operations or any of the great things that they have modeled uh, because they have the expertise. And we look forward to more communities uh, taking their, their expert developed vocabularies and bringing them, plugging them in. In fact, they don't need anything from us. They can do it without ask, asking permission. Let's look at the next slide. So you might have imagined in your mind, OK, look, there's a standard for a portable interoperable description of workflows. You, you could see some of the use cases. I want to share some of the specific ones that we care about, we're doing already, or we're working towards. For me, as somebody who, who was a, a practicing bioinformatician uh, and also a software engineer, I, I really care about this um, reproducibility, but I actually think re it's, it's a low bar. I actually really care more about reusability. Um, I'm going to be able to download your paper study your methods, but really, I should be able to play with them pretty quickly using my own data uh, and, and digging in to figure out how you did what you did and how you put together those programs, what choices you made. And so reusability and, and publication is a, is a long-term goal that, that we think a lot about. We're already seeing workflows being created, developed, improved, and run across institutions, regions, countries, and continents. So we have a workflow that was begun in Australia, it was picked up by a team who was meeting in South Africa and Pretoria and is now being improved and extended uh, by folks all over, including Europe and uh, North America. And we, we're really excited to see more of this. Actually, right now I'm funded on the short term to support the uh, EMBL EBI's metagenomics team um, and making their metagenomics platform more portable in conjunction with and GRAST at Argonne National Lab. Um, and uh, I, I make fun of these two. I call them frenemies because they collaborate, but they also compete. And it's great to see them be able to exchange components of their workflows, even though they have uh, dramatically different infrastructures. Another use case we see a lot is contests and challenges. So if you know about a dream challenge, a couple of those are using CWL as the way that contestants submit their analysis um, for review. And what I'd like to see more of that may be interesting to this crowd is analysis on non-public data sets. So to have somebody send, send a little bit of their analysis or send something to find out, does this non-public data even have something that's of interest to them before they go fill out all that legal paperwork and, and set all that up? Let's look at the next slide. Um, so we have some early adopters. This actually was super incomplete. We've got a lot more since then. But if you get these slides, you can click through from presentations from last year's Bioinformatics Open Source Conference from then. But I want to look at the, the, the very next slide has a nice picture and of an example workflow to get a, um, just to give you all a feeling of the complexity that can be modeled using it. So people are really are doing quite complex. It's not a toy. 
1.0 has been out for almost a year now. And uh, this is a, a, a team from the uh, uh, NCI uh, Genomics Data Commons. So they do great work. And this visualization was produced um, with a University of Manchester produced uh, student, actually undergraduate student made this visualizer, that URL at the bottom. You can see more CWL workflows at view.commonwl.org. Let's look at the next slide. Uh, and I just want to give credit to the co-authors and contributors. Um, I guess I should update this. It's, it's almost been a year, so, you know, the version 1.01 just encapsulates a bit of polish and a few things we discovered is is coming out anytime now. And then a 1.1 that makes slightly bigger changes is in development. Um, so we're, we're moving along, but we slow down how fast we're releasing as people sort of catch up and, and adopt. We want to be more thoughtful. I think I have a couple more. Let's see what's after this. So I, I want to talk a little bit about process. I think that matters because it reflects values. So um, I come from an open source, open science background. And if uh, sometimes people hear about standards development and they think about ISO and nation, you know, national standards organizations, which are very slow and expensive. We're not really running this project like that. We're running it like an open source, open science project. And it's been very public, very inclusive, and open for uh, it's free to read, free to participate, free to implement, free to use, and that's never going to change. We can go forward. Um, and so as an encapsulation of these values, I really promote this open-stand.org. It's a statement about ways of making standards in the modern world. So if any of you all involved with standards, I really recommend you check this out. Um, but for example, one of the, the principles is voluntary adoption. So we think we've made something useful. We invite people to use it, but we're not here to tell anybody you must use CWL. Uh, in fact, if you disagree, we'd love to hear from you to figure out how we can improve it, if that's possible. One more, Nick. So of course, there's always challenges with these things. Uh, Carol Goebel taught me the phrase, free is in puppies, and I think a standard is. So we're uh, working on making this uh, effort sustainable and fund it in the long term. And hopefully uh, soon I'll be able to announce, um, we're working on it right now, that we're joining an NGO, a public charity in the U.S., uh, to, to give it a legal body to own the standard, to make it firmly in the public interest, um, and to, for the project to live as long as, as it is useful. What, I have an inspirational slide next, which is, so what can we do with a, a, something like CWL? And I really do think that some evolutionary descendant of this, this related standard called researchobject.org, um, might actually be how we communicate the digital artifacts, uh, like workflows, from our research, from our publicly funded research and the peer review literature, or whatever is going to replace the peer review literature, the traditional funding, or, or from traditional publishers as well. Um, that's going to take some more work. It's more of a social problem than a technical one. So that's an exciting development. Um, I, I don't think I have much after this, but let's see what's next, Nick. Uh, yeah, I just mentioned some of these things. There'll be more implementations, uh, saying letters of support, or been assisting Galaxy, Taverna, Kepler, Xenon, and others. And uh, we're going to improve our ability to handle the metadata in a rich way. Well, I thank you all for your time, and I look forward to talking more at the panel and responding to your questions. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Uh, as Michael mentioned, we'll be collecting questions, so feel free to uh, write the questions in the in the questions box of your GoToWebinar, and we'll collect them up at the end and ask the, the panel in, in one go. But thanks once again for that. I'm now going to hand over to James Lumley, and I'll just make him a presenter so that uh, he can show his slides. Uh, and now, just introducing James, to uh, to you. So James has uh, uh, over 20 years of experience in cheminformatics and computational chemistry through a number of roles both at Arrow and other uh, biotechs and now he's working at Eli Lilly in the UK. Hi Nick, hi everyone. Uh, can you just confirm you can see my screen okay? I can, it looks fine. Thanks. 
So I'm just going to be talking today about accessing the OpenFAX Link Data API with NIME. And uh, at Lilly, we have a, a large investment in NIME. We've been using NIME for, for many years before I joined, in fact. Um, we developed uh, quite an infrastructure to support uh, working. I work within the research IT side, uh, the scientists' background. But we work heavily to support our scientists. And one thing we do is, is support a NIME environment, uh, a, a workflow tool called NIME. Um, in order for them to be able to work more efficiently. And uh, we are constantly integrating new things into that environment to make sure that the scientists have access to the right data and the right tools uh, to do the analytics they need on a daily basis. Uh, what I'm going to present here is work we're just about to release into the open source. And it's a, a, simple, a single, simple NIME node. Uh, there's a lot of things going on under the hood. And it will, should open up sort of the promise of a lot of the data we see in the OpenFAX world uh, to the NIME community. Uh, there have been some efforts before uh, done around this. There were some really fantastic efforts done by Christine and others on some early versions of the NIME node. Um, we hope that we've uh, made some significant improvements and built on their work, really. So if you don't know what NIME is, uh, NIME is a data analytics platform. Um, it's open source. And it's got over a thousand modules or nodes that you can connect together um, to uh, all major data sources, supporting many data types, and uh, you can analyze them. Uh, many, da many data analytics nodes, and obviously write uh, your data output. So, for example, uh, on the left on the screen, you can see a, a screenshot of the Nine platform. So you have the node repository at the bottom left, where you can drag and drop nodes to read different file formats, JSON, XML images, whatever you want. Uh, you can manipulate your data, analyze your data, things like decision tree learning, whatever you, you would like to do, uh, using many uh, sort of uh, different types of tool blending approaches. So you could use Python, R, Weka, SQL Java, whatever you would like, uh, and many other uh, algorithmic tools that have been integrated um, to complete really uh, any kind of data analysis you'd like. It, in some ways, it's been called a toolbox for a data scientist. Um, so this screenshot here is the community nodes that are provided by the open source community. Many people around the world contribute um, code to NIME in the form of nodes. Uh, we've been doing that for some time in the form of the Earlwood nodes. You can see those in the folder on the left. Uh, and as of next month, when we get the code release approved, there will be in there an OpenFAX node. Uh, and I'm going to show you um, how that node is working now. So. Uh, First of all, um, NIME has a really easy way to manage preferences. Uh, you will be uh, managing things like an application ID and a key to access the data and a URL endpoint. And you can put those all neatly into the preferences and not have to worry about configuring things after that point. But these are the API keys that you need access to, you need to have to access the data on the API for authentication. Uh, once you start to use the node, uh, it's got a fairly simple interface that, that varies a lot of functionality in it. The API keys for accessing the OpenFAX API is at the top of the screen. Uh, that should be pre-populated if you set in the preferences. And the next thing you can do is to select the method type you would want. So if you want to open up the world of uh, OpenFAX data, you can really select the method call you want to use. And rather than have to worry about coding against the REST API, you can simply use the NIME node to put in a URI and query a specific endpoint with the correct inputs and get good outputs. So here you can see an example uh, where you can push either an input port uh, on the NIME node. Uh, the nodes allow you to uh, stream data from a previous node into the current node. Um, and then the API call, in this case, is to get assay call we're doing uh, would run for every row of your input table. Or alternatively, as in the example I've got in the screen, you can define a single text string, in this case the ASCII URI, and it will execute once and once only against your single input URI. So in this way, you can uh, query, very quickly build up uh, a workflow where you're, you're pushing large amounts of data through the workflow, uh, pulling back large amounts of data through each of the API calls in an easy to use way. Here's a, a drop down view of the uh, screen that allows you to see all of the different method calls we've got. 
um, assays, chemical structure search, all the RSC ones, classes. Um, there's many different calls that we've we've pretty much implemented most of the major calls uh, within this drop-down box to select the method type. And the configuration dialog, uh, if it needs more than one input, will change underneath that to allow you to specify exactly what you want as your parameters for each of the method calls on the API. At the bottom of the screen, you can see clearly that there are two output formats. Uh, there's a second output port. So two things, when you, when you push some data in or you define a single assay URI in the node and you would uh, call the uh, API using your input data, um, what you get back is one or two outputs. You will get a CSV, simple tabular output, that's easy to use straight away. But for the more advanced users and developers, you may actually want to see the JSON response because there may be additional information in that. And really this reflects the fact that we see the OpenFact system something we want to explore the data in, in a very transparent way. So we've really uh, thought about developers and people who are sort of debugging the system and uh, really digging into the data. But we've also tried to make it very usable for an end user, one of our scientists who just wants to get back a, a flat table of data. So here at the bottom of the screen, you can see that I've got the JSON output, I've got some uh, input, and uh, I'll show you some of what the output looks like. Uh, this is uh, the raw tabular return. Um, I can pivot that to show you just the column names and values. So in this case, you can see I get multiple columns back out um, for the different assay. In this case, I've queried it with an assay ID. I'm getting textual data and other information about that specific assay based on the API return. Alternatively, I could use the raw uh, second port, the JSON output, and pivot that and, and parse the JSON exactly as I want, or in fact the XML equally. And finally, there's a much more in-depth tree-based uh, JSON view that's quite a powerful way to view uh, all of the data that's coming out of the API. This is a really nice way to browse through the data. Um, this is uh, an example of the full uh, JSON extraction um, using some of the JSON nodes. Uh, one of the advantages of the, uh, sorry, this is just unpivoting the data, but what you can do is, is use many of the different uh, JSON nodes embedded in the NIME system to do complex extraction from the JSON object. Um, and that's one of the advantages of the, the NIME workbench. I think there's many nodes in there for parsing JSON or XML or you can simply use the, the JSON to table automated nodes to do that. But there's a lot of tools inside um, NIME that would allow you different ways of exploring the data. Uh, here's an example of those nodes. The JSON to table is the one I just showed on the previous slide, but there's obviously JSON path uh, query nodes that you can use to build your own query. Uh, we do support chemical structures in this node fairly well. So we've implemented converters on, on the input. So if you're taking different smiles or different molecule formats from your workflow, it doesn't matter really what format you have, whether you've got a smile string or an SDF or an inch or something else. We have ways in which we can convert from those different formats automatically for you. So you can do something like a substructure search from any type of input chemical structure, any different type of format, and very quickly um, get back the output from a substructure search. Um, finally, uh, there's for the more developer-minded or for the, the testers, there's options to override on specific nodes for, uh, if you want to have a little bit more control over which API version you're hitting uh, or timeout particularly is an issue where you have large data calls. So to summarize then, uh, I've gone fairly quickly, but I think it's just an overview to show that we've just deployed um, hopefully we'll be deploying to the open source a new NIME node for exploring the OpenFAX uh, system. Uh, designed for users, it provides an easy configuration of the API and easy to use tabular data return. And designed for developers, you can see uh, a really uh, full JSON response or XML response that you can dig into with quite a powerful set of tools inside the NIME workbench. And I think longer term, uh, we'll be uh, looking at doing some workflows to prove out how useful the node is and, and iron out any issues we see. Uh, it should be released in the, the next day or so. Um, only thing I want to say is thanks to Luke as well. Luke Bullard did a lot of the, the, the well, he did all the Java coding work for that node, so uh, a big credit to Luke there for the work he's been doing on that. So over to you, Nick. Thanks for the time. 
No, thank you very much, James. And yeah, definitely thank you to, to your colleagues too for that. So uh, we'll obviously be you can obviously let us know when that goes into the into the open source and we'll we'll do a bit of comms and equally happy perhaps to have a some follow-on sessions after this around how to uh, how to extend it and equally the feedback that the users have on on the open facts api too um, so and by all means think of any questions that you might want to ask james at this point in the in the question session so in our uh, third uh, present today. I'm just going to uh, introduce Jean-Marc Neefs, who some of you will perhaps know already, who uh, has been working at Janssen and was certainly a, a key contributor to, to OpenFAX uh, as a project and, and, and ongoing. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, show some slides that he's put together uh, around the use of uh, some example workflows that we've been developed in, in Pipeline Pilot. So, Jean-Marc, would you like to just let me know when you want to change slides? Is that okay? Yeah, that's that's perfectly fine. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I should acknowledge first the work of Eric Garakotti at uh, Biovia, who's been instrumental at making the individual components for Pipeline Pilot. Now, as you heard in the previous uh, talk by James, um, Pipeline Pilot is a workflow tool, just very parallel to uh, what NIME has to offer. Um, but this is a commercial solution from BioVia, and they offer us uh, support as part of contracts. So in the next slide, you see that initially Open Facts in the early days was about compounds and targets, and there were plans to include pathways. Nevertheless, even with that focused content, it was possible to already answer a number of questions that were asked in the Open Facts Consortium, as you see in uh, the next slide. I will not uh, offend you by uh, reading them out loud, but essentially it's about searching for uh, compound information and search for target information and activity. As, a, as an example, you see in the next slide, some of the API calls to uh, the open facts uh, data are uh, highlighted in red. Um, so they're not full workflows, but they are essential components where um, you can add, just as uh, James explained in, in his demonstration, you can add existing nodes um, from existing pipeline pilot components. And you can summarize this as, well, do you want to search open facts, yes or no? That's the filter. Uh, then you have your collection of accession numbers for targets, for instance, filter to the first occurrence only. And then with your accession numbers, look for um, those accession numbers in open facts. That's the uh, red box at the top. And you get the first occurrence from whatever you get uh, back from uh, open facts. The second part is actually following the end of the first part. When you have those um, identifiers, actually the universal resource uh, indicators, um, you can reuse that as uh, the input for the next call, like find me target pharmacology information for those get the molecules from the smiles you obtain, and that's again a normal uh, pipeline pilot component, so you can see the structures, convert them, and then store the data in uh, the final node, which is called OpenFact. And if you uh, build further onto this, like in uh, the next slide, you see that this part is actually part of a much larger workflow where the top rectangle with the blue dashes is the previous uh, workflow that I showed, but you can couple this in a much larger uh, workflows, including um, other data from open facts or uh, internal reference compound data or internal or external data from uh, Campbell or licensed data from GoStar. And each of those caches, if you wish, listed 
are stored in memory can be used in the end to summarize the information in uh, user interfaces that, that people know. It can be put in the web or it can be imported in delimited files or in HTML or it can be opened in internal uh, proprietary applications. So you see, just with the target, the compound and the pharmacology, you can already answer uh, a real a real question for from real life that is used uh, throughout the uh, the organization, at least in discovery. And became more interesting uh, in the years after that, where there were really pathways involved, and there were some uh, initial steps to diseases and tissues. So this really expands the possible queries. In the next slide, you have a few of them. So. Now, in addition to searching for a compound or a target, you can search for information on a disease, the target in a pathway, or active compounds on a target. So in the next slide, um, this gives you um, an additional pipeline. There are, there are a couple of extra possibilities. Either you start from a disease, and you search for targets that are involved. You see these red nodes on the left. And then you search for the pharmacology on those targets, the pharmacology data for all compounds that are active on the target. Or you start from a target, you look which diseases are involved, and you look for all the targets in that disease, and you look for compounds again. Or you start from compounds, you check on which targets they are active, and when you have a target, you can find the, tar the diseases that are involved. And that's exactly what you can do with these initial nodes. You're not limited by available workflows, let's say. You just build your own. You see here in this slide, we used only three compounds that were fetching information from OpenFact. But all the rest, like detaching the nodes, flatten a hierarchy, keeping stuff that is a disease or a syndrome, these are things that are available. This is information that is available in the output from open facts and you can filter the data around until you come to the results you you need to have and you summarize that in this case in an HTML table but you could just as well summarize this in a tab delimited file or in internal applications and uh, with the final year of open facts in the next slide well, everything was available so it allowed us to make searches for compounds, targets, diseases, pathways, and tissues. And you see there are arrows going around. That means actually you could start from any point and go to any other point using open facts components. And this is exactly what people have done here. And in slide 10, there's a more schematic view of uh, one application and that has been published uh, by uh, Daniela and some, some colleagues and participants in, in Open Facts. And essentially, once you have, for, for example, uh, results on phenotypic screens, you typically have a list of potential targets. Now, there's two possibilities. You can ask a number of scientists to go and look and see what they know about all these targets, let's say 50 or 100. Those are potentially interesting. But if you want to like find out what's known, you need to, you need to know which targets are involved with which disease or which compounds are found active on uh, the, the targets that are showing some interest out of the phenotypic screen, you know that there's going to be results and there's going to be some chemistry involved usually. You have a list of possible targets and using the information that is available in open facts, it is possible to start from the targets, aggregate the data based on compound classification. So you know if you use if you're using a number of compounds which uh, classification they should be in you can find out all the compound pharmacology and derive 
the activity on targets. And then when you have the targets, you can have a classification on those targets, where these uh, targets are active, what uh, the gene ontology information is about, or identify the pathways that those targets are involved in and, and remove targets that are not involved in uh, potential pathways of interest or diseases uh, for all these targets. This is one of the examples only in that paper. But this shows that uh, with the flexibility of these components, you can build practically any uh, workflow that is of interest for a question that is of interest to therapeutic areas. Now, Daniela is also working uh, on another paper. Um, and uh, maybe she, she can explain a little bit what it's going to be about. Um, I will end the presentation here um, by thanking again uh, Andre Karakotti, who has been instrumental in also making sure that the workflows behind this schema uh, are working, are efficient, and also are published in the, the BioVIA forum. There you can, you can register for the forum and then search for open facts workflows. And I would say if, if you really want to do that, I encourage you to contact Eric, uh, uh, sorry, Andre, uh, who will provide you uh, additional information on the Bio BioVIA forum. And uh, yeah, I also want to thank Nick for giving me the opportunity to present this. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc, for that. Um, as mentioned, uh, what we're going to do now is uh, kick off uh, a bit of a, a panel discussion. Uh, so if you do have any questions, by all means, uh, put it into the question part of the GoToWebinar software. It's the one at the bottom, uh, just above chat, if you can hopefully see that. Uh, and what we'll do is then we'll, we'll perhaps either invite you onto the line or, or read it out. Uh, just whilst we wait for questions coming in, uh, I'll just go back to showing a slide actually that Daniela gave me that is about some of the examples from open facts uh, in terms of some recent publications and we'll we'll, we'll put this out into the the slide share too but D Daniela was there any the, the papers that were created was there any any particular one that you wanted to, to mention to people from this list um, maybe just a general overview sort of because we started quite early in the projects with uh, use cases and how you could use open facts and their um, workflow tools um, came to be a quite efficient way to, to solve those use cases. So the first one was this application of the Open Pharmacological Concepts Triple Store to support drug discovery research we published in PLOS One. But then also um, a paper on um, answering these uh, questions that were stated really early on in the project. Um, the third paper here is also what Jean-Marc just mentioned, uh, the workflows on phenotypic screening. And the last paper is sort of just an example from our research group, so uh, less focus on open facts but more on the workflow examples, sort of to, uh, to collect data from different sources, manual curation but also public data sources, and to analyze this data then. So, sort of just a uh, short overview on, on papers uh, we already published uh, on workflows. Uh, what Jamak mentioned, also what we're currently working on is well, sort of a methods chapter explaining how the user can really use the workflow tools to access open facts. So, sort of like a step-by-step -step, uh, guidance how to create such a workflow. Okay, Thank, thanks for that, Daniela. Uh, well, one question that uh, has come up on, on the set is where someone's asked where where do people see workflows heading in the future? And I suppose we've heard a little bit of that from from the talks today. 
uh, I wonder if I could be cheeky and ask uh, Derek in a minute uh, what his views are on on how perhaps workflows could help the sort of the life science researcher, researcher. and then I'll perhaps t t ask turn it back to perhaps Michael or or, or uh, Andre to uh, to think about it from the platform perspective. Uh, Derek, how do you think workflows will sort of evolve in the future? I, I think from what I'm seeing is that everyone has a pet platform, uh, depending where they've come from, either from an academic lab or from an industry partnership situation. And each farmer has its own embedded reasons for having a particular tool or not. But regardless of the tool, everyone is pushing towards the flexibility component because data sources are popping up everywhere. And predetermining what you want to join is be, is not an option for most scientists. They're actually wanting to explore. So some of the things we've talked about today and shown in, in these slides here is the ability to add in and augment the already existing, what I call backbone workflows, and, and therefore extending your ability to reach into other data sources. So adding on another um, key disease source, for example, or another ontology to better describe what you've got, I think is the power of the workflow. It allows you to explore while you think and not be tied into a rigid application. Uh, and I think a way of being able to walk between technologies, whether it be Nine, Pipeline Pilot or, or Taverna or anything like that, is, I think is one of the opportunities that we have, shall we say, uh, rather than being nailed to one particular technology. But as I said before, each institution will have its own um, reasons for being one or another. But the, our ability to share, I think, is important. Uh, so I was very interested to hear what happened in the, in the CWL space, because that opens a potential for um, not having factions and actually share. Thanks. And, and actually, uh, you'd asked the question, maybe this is to help Michael with his answer. Do you, Michael, do you think uh, there's value in, in maps translating some of the use cases that you've seen from OpenFAX into CWL? Do you think that would be useful? Oh, of course. I mean, it's a great way to um, encourage use and find new users. Um, I, I mean, it's just shocking. Every month I learn about some new platform or some in-house thing that people have used. I mean, some institutions, they have multiple platforms. You know, Broad is working on number 10. It's to replace the first nine, right? And it's, you know, um, so all, the, all these things get in the way of users actually asking these questions and searching you know, and finding answers and, and getting work done. Um, so I, I, I think that would be great to see CWL components um, that describe all the open facts uh, tools and services. Okay. I, I agree, Mike. Uh, this is Jean-Marc here. Um, but um, what gets in the way of many users is new tools. I found that um, I'm working on a, a project internally that is actually pumping the information uh, to applications that people know, so they know how to interact with the existing tools, and that that shows to be very successful. We tried to develop a, a new website, and it's just it's just never working because people don't have. The URL, they just don't remember where it is. They even forget the name of the application. So, I think the yeah the, the new tools problem is really key. Something I, I try to promote with CWL is making things, um, making things on a human scale. You know, especially working in tech, we're really influenced by you know, the dot-com companies and the Silicon Valley culture and this obsession with web scale. And that's that's a horrible idea. There's people involved. So these need to be small communities. You know, people use what their neighbors use, what their colleagues use. And so you really need to be able to get to the environment where they're comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's the training is so hard. But but then we have this problem of all these bespoke infrastructures that then later when things need to scale up or we need to publish, 
uh, cause a lot of challenges. So yeah, I, I, I think the we were kind of so the when we were never as successful as when we completely hit the new things. So nobody knows how it works. Nobody knows where it is. Nobody knows where it reads. Nobody knows about the data structure. It it they just have their usual usual application. There's just one more menu item, and that follows uh, whatever they are using or or used to use, and it works very well. And reception is really great because they say, ah, finally we can do stuff that we couldn't do before and we can reuse existing tools. So, I think so Mark, I think there's a, so, sorry to interrupt you, I think there's an element there though that there is a, there has to be some form of depth of in, investment to start with in a tool that you're actually adding mm -hmm. pieces to. So back to my point earlier on, e each farm organization has picked their base tool of choice and mm -hmm. I think what you're alluding to is adding different nodes and different drop downs in, in Python Pilot. I think the same is true from a from a nine scenario. You have a yeah. common tool that the industry, the organization you're in uses, and and what we've talked about here is is reuse against a common data set. Mm -hmm. Just just yeah. to point from different from different angles. Mm -hmm. so one thing I'd add, I think the way what we've seen with the nine environment is, um, yes, there's always going to be a plethora of software packages. You can't stop that because the software needs to do something very specific for a specific business group. But you know the API economy, if you want to call it that, is quite helpful there. Uh, and and OpenFacts is a good example of that because that remains static and multiple applications can take advantage of what you've done under the hood of the API. And you can also refactor heavily behind the API and change your architect architecture extensively. But you know you still have that one access point um, that decouples these big environments like the OpenFacts architecture from the actual application. So it, it's mm -hmm. quite a flexible way to move multiple applications and multiple data sources and environments forward. I think the problem comes in the future is if things migrate into the cloud more, uh, the, the question is how well is that going to work at scale if you're doing really big calculations with big data sets. You don't want to have to be constantly going in and out of APIs to do that. You need all your data in one place. Um, so I think there's a, there's a slight tension there between, what, certainly we see this at Arrow where, sorry, <laughs> at Lily, um, between deploying everything via APIs into Nine, but then in the future we know that that's going to break things like data streaming and cloud-based work that we might potentially do. And, and maybe just, just thinking out loud, I had a question more for given that OpenFAX provides an API, is perhaps the feedback from you as workflow experts, it's sort of thinking about, you know, what, what does an API provider need to do in the future? And then equally picking up on, on James's point about, you know, the volume, the four Vs perhaps, which will affect uh, uh, workflows in the future. That I'm wondering if that's even a topic for a, a future webinar where we think about some of the other uh, you know, higher volume tools that might need to be integrated into workflow, if that makes sense? It does make, but I think we have potentially two different audiences that we're actually talking about in terms of consumers. Those, are, those who are not having heavy data use but need to have access to traverse many data types to do exploratory science versus the heavy compute user who want to suck everything and do something nasty in, in memory. And I think those are two different audience is impossible to different topics and to your point maybe we do need a seminar on that so so maybe with that in mind and then and sort of perhaps an open question to our audience but by all means uh, send us feedback afterwards in terms of perhaps uh, topics or, or building on the topics that the that we've already discussed today uh, and uh, as I say, we, we, we know that we've got some things that are happening in the project at the moment with, uh, as James has mentioned, the re release of the, the, the version, the first version of the, the NIME, the, the updated NIME nodes. Uh, and we're also plans to uh, refresh the data in OpenFAX2 over the coming weeks. So uh, we have uh, some plans to do that in a phased approach during April and May. So we'll be happy to keep people updated on that. 
Uh, and equally, if people have any other suggestions for webinar topics or speakers that they'd like to hear in this series, then uh, again, by all means, let uh, send that in to, to OpenFAX via Twitter or, or through our email addresses like info at openfaxfoundation.org. And then maybe it, it gives me the chance to also thank both all our panelists and presenters today uh, and uh, thank you for their time for putting their slides together and for a, a good discussion and equally thank you the audience and we wish you a good uh, rest of the week and look forward to you uh, again joining our next session which will be sending out details out in in the coming weeks so thank you very much everyone and we'll we'll end the uh, we'll end the webinar there have a good week thank you nick bye bye thank you